Yeah. All right. So uh, today we are really happy to have uh, Nima Nari from Stanford, and he'll talk about long title, but log contains <laughs> polynomials are there, sampling is there, and he'll tell you about all the rest. All right. Please go. Thanks. Thanks, Avi. Um, so, uh, so this is joint work with students at Stanford, uh, Yegane Ali Mohammadi, uh, Kiran Shiragor, and Jun Wang. But it actually builds on a lot of prior work with uh, lots of other people. In particular, if you've seen talks by Cynthia, Shayana Vescan, and Kui Kui Liu, who uh, will all have given talks in your seminars, uh, this is actually very related to to those talks, uh, and and uh, and actually builds on top of them. Okay, so so let me start with uh, mo uh, with a motivational problem. Uh, I'm gonna start with very familiar things. Hopefully, everybody knows what perfect matchings are. You're given a graph, a subset of edges uh, is a perfect matching if you uh, visit every vertex exactly once. And there is an important problem. You can there's an important algorithmic problem you can ask about perfect matchings, and uh, this is the problem. You're you um, uh, you want to design an algorithm that takes a graph, outputs the number of perfect matches. Okay, uh, so so there there are a lot of reasons why this problem is important. Um, uh, most uh, most prominent of them is that uh, this was what this was basically the first major problem uh, whose counting version, the the counting question for it, was shown to be uh, sharply complete. This was done by Valiant in uh, 1979. Whereas uh, you know the search version of this problem, finding out whether or not there exists that uh, perfect matching or not, or distinguishing between zero counts and non-zero counts, is is uh, is known to be polynomial time. In fact, perhaps the the first uh, you know polynomial time algorithms were were designed for this problem. Right? Okay, so. Um, so this problem is, is sharply complete, which means that we, we probably have no hope of getting a, a, an algorithm that exactly counts perfect matchings. So the next question you can ask is, what about approximations? And if you haven't seen approximate counting before, this is the notion of approximation that we are interested in. Uh, we, we want an algorithm that outputs a number that up to some constant factor uh, approximates the true count. And uh, you know, for, for this talk, uh, you can assume that this, these constants are just 0.9 and 1.1. For a wide class of problems, uh, any constants you get here can automatically be boosted to, to uh, any other arbitrary uh, constant that you want. So if you get, I don't know, two here, you can boost it to one plus epsilon for any epsilon. Okay, so it really doesn't matter. So unfortunately for, for this problem, uh, getting an approximate uh, counter is still open. Getting an efficient approximation algorithm is still open. Uh, and you know, uh, this, is, this is one of the cases that is open of this meta question in the literature on counting and sampling, which is, uh, you know, what, so, so, so if you want to have any sort of uh, multiplicative factor approximation, you better be able to distinguish between the case where this count is zero and not. Uh, and the meta question is, you know, uh, we have a lot of problems where we can find a solution. Those are exactly problems in P. Uh, for these problems, uh, when can we uh, design approximate counters, right? Uh, so this is one of the big open questions that's, that's left open in this, uh, under this meta uh, question. Uh, question, Nima. Yes. You are distinguishing here the non bipartite case from the bipartite yeah, case? Yeah, I'll get to that in just one okay. slide. <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, so, uh, so all hope is not lost. Uh, there are important graph families for which uh, approximation uh, uh, is known, for which counting algorithms are known. Uh, the most celebrated one is the class of bipartite graphs. Um, so for this class, uh, a result of Jerome Sinclair and Vigoda in 2004 showed that you can approximately count the number of perfect matchings up to any factor you want, uh, one plus epsilon. Uh, so the name for these types of algorithms is fully polynomial time randomized approximation scheme. Uh, so so this, is, uh, this means that the running time of the algorithm also depends polynomially on one over epsilon if you haven't seen this before. Okay. So in, in bipartite graphs, 
This is, this is basically the best you can hope for. So everything is known. So, uh, so the algorithm that Jerome Sinclair Vigoda used is uh, was was based on Mar the Markov chain Monte Carlo method, um, uh, and there is a long history behind that. Um, there is still a, a tiny question left open here, which is whether you can actually design uh, uh, deterministic algorithms that achieve the same factor. But let's not get into that. Uh, it's tangential to this talk. Okay. Another question. Uh, small comment. Uh, an equivalent way to state this is, uh, in, in fact, in a way the, uh, this result is more general, is about approximating the permanent of a non-negative matrix. Yes. <laughs> Thanks, Ali. Yes. Uh, so in fact, the, the, the first result of Valiant who showed that uh, the, uh, uh, the problem is sharply complete was actually done for bipartite graphs. And it was actually phrased as, you know, computing the permanent of matrices is, uh, is sharply complete, even for zero one matrices. Uh, and uh, uh, yeah, so, so, so there was a lot of interest just in the bipartite case. But uh, for this talk, because we know everything about the bipartite case, let me focus on non-bipartite case. Okay. So, so there is another uh, strange uh, family of graphs for which not only can you uh, approximately count, but you can ac actually exactly count the number of perfect matchings. And that's the class of planar graphs. Um, so for planar graphs, uh, there are polynomial time algorithms that count perfect matchings exactly. This was first shown by Castellane. And uh, uh, you know, the motivation for it was coming from, uh, from statistical physics. Uh, so Castellane and Temperley and Fisher showed in uh, Simultaneously in 1961, uh, how to do it for for the for the two-dimensional grid basically, uh, and then Castellane managed to show the, uh, to generalize the two-dimensional grid case to to basically all graphs. And if you haven't seen the ideas behind this, it's basically uh, relating the perfect matching the number of perfect matchings to the determinant of a certain uh, signed version of the adjacency matrix of your graph. That's called the Tut uh, matrix. Um, so yeah, so, but for, for this talk, uh, I'm just going to use this result existentially, not going to go into the details of how this is done. Okay. All right, so, so for, for perfect matchings, these are the two important classes where we have, uh, uh, where we have good algorithms. Uh, but as soon as you modify the problem slightly, one of these graph classes becomes problematic. Um, so let's say uh, I modify the problem to, to ask for the count of not necessarily perfect matchings. So let's say I fix the number k and I ask you uh, find matchings of k edges. So these are subsets of edges of size k, which visit every vertex at most once. Okay. So uh, so in the in the uh, in the bipartite case or or let's say uh, you, you actually had an algorithm that could count perfect matchings in arbitrary graphs. You could also use that to count uh, the number of K matchings in, in an arbitrary graph. Uh, there is a very simple idea to do this. Uh, you just add a bunch of dummy nodes connected to every vertex uh, in your graph. So these dummy nodes have to be matched to some vertices that prevents those vertices from being matched internally inside the graph. So, so by controlling the number of dummy nodes, you basically control the size of the internal matching of the graph. Uh, so yeah. So, so this idea actually works uh, not just on, on the class of all graphs, but also for bipartite graphs. You can, you can make sure that adding these dummy nodes re, uh, retains bipartiteness. Okay, so, so because we have Jerome Sinclair Vigoda's algorithm, uh, you know, this problem is also solved in the bipartite case, right? We have, we have approximate counting algorithms here, okay? Unfortunately, this gadget of adding dummy nodes uh, destroys planarity. Um, so, so, so this simple idea doesn't work for, for planar graphs, even though we can count perfect matchings in planar graphs. And there's actually a more fundamental reason uh, why such a thing shouldn't work or why uh, you know, the underlying algorithm that counts perfect matchings in planar graphs cannot be modified to count K matchings. So Jerome in uh, 1987 actually showed that 
you know, if you want to count K matchings and not perfect matchings in planar graphs, the problem is sharply complete. Okay. So, so modification of known algorithms for perfect matchings uh, should probably not work unless, you know, sharply complete, uh, unless P equals sharply, right? Okay. So, so, so the, uh, this still, you know, uh, this still leaves the possibility of approximate counting, and that's the result I want to show you today. That actually, for any planar graph, there exists a, a, a randomized algorithm that approximately counts k matchings within uh, with any arbitrary degree of approximation with high probability, or in, in other words, FPS. All right, uh, so one thing I wanna mention before going into the details of things is that there is nothing special in about planar graphs here. Um, uh, more formally, uh, what we show is that uh, uh, there is a reduction from counting K matchings to counting perfect matchings, but on any downward closed family of graphs. Uh, so as long as you can count perfect matchings in induced subgraphs of the input graph, you can, you can perform the same thing. Uh, so there are more general uh, graph families besides planar graphs where you can count perfect matchings. For example, bounded genus graphs, uh, uh, some, some minor free families of graphs and so on. Okay, so so this, this does generalize so often. Okay. So, uh, so uh, before I go on, I wanna mention that uh, we can actually work with weighted uh, distributions on, on, uh, on matchings. Uh, that's also the, mo the main motivation behind these results that, that uh, so, so there, is a, there is a certain weighted distribution, uh, natural weighted distribution you can define on, on the set of matchings of a graph, which is called the monomer dimer system. So our results also generalize to monomer dimer system. Okay, so what is the monomer dimer system? Uh, so suppose that you have a graph. Can I disturb you to, for a minute? Yes. I didn't understand the, se the sentence where you say there is nothing special about planar graph except of that. In what sense? I mean, planar graphs are very special. So in what sense do you mean that? Uh, so I mean, if you have any, so, so let's say F is a family, F is a, a downward closed family of graphs. And uh, you can count perfect matchings in F. Oh, I see. If it should be a downward closed family. Yes. Okay. So among families like that. Okay. Okay. Yes. Okay. Among a family like this, where you can count. I, I miss these two words. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I was thinking about expanders, for example, or something like that. But, uh, and then it's very special. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. And by, by downward closed, I mean, you know, I understand. Yeah. subgraph closed. Yeah, I understand. Yeah. Okay, so uh, all right. So what is a monomer dimer system? It's a certain distribution you can define on matchings of a graph. Uh, the reason behind the name is uh, coming from statistical physics, uh, where you know you you think of these as atoms that can bond together. Uh, so so the the pairs of vertices that get matched are basically forming, you know, uh, molecules out of two atoms. And uh, you know you call these uh, these paired uh, vertices dimers. You call the unpaired vertices monomers. Okay. So so in statistical so so the statistical physics model is that uh, you have some activity or a positive weight for each monomer and also each dimer, and the probability of every matching is just going to be the product of these weights for the dimers and the monomers. Right. So so there are these positive weights lambda e. Uh, and, and also positive weights ZV. Uh, these are assigned to vertices. These are assigned to edges. To every matching, you can assign the product of these, right? So, so, so this way, you get a weight for every matching, and you can define a probability distribution by normalizing these weights so that they sum up to one that defines a probability distribution on matchings. So, so the counting question is, is computing the normalizing factor or the sum of these weights over all the set of all matchings. Um, so, so, uh, you know, uh, we can, so, so basically the algorithms I'm gonna show you handle this too, handle approximately computing this too. And uh, for the rest of the talk, I'm gonna use some powerful uh, 
uh, results from the 80s uh, shown by Jerome Valiant and Vazirani, who showed that for a very large class of problems, including this one, including monomer dimer systems and matchings and so on, approximate counting is basically equivalent to approximate sampling. So, so if I can produce uh, samples which approximately follow this law, then I can also bootstrap using these results and approximately compute the partition function and, uh, and count and whatnot. Right? Okay. So, uh, so even for monomer dimer systems where you don't restrict the size of the matching, uh, Jerome showed that uh, 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 computing the part, uh, computing the partition function exactly is is still sharply complete. Uh, so, so not only can we compute the partition function uh, for monomer dimer systems and k-matchings, we can also compute the partition function for monomer dimer systems conditioned on having a size k monomer set. Okay. All right. Uh, so, so before before I go on, I should say that there are some positive results for for sampling from monomer dimer systems, uh, not not the uh, not the condition version of them, but uh, but uh, the the size unconstrained version of them. Uh, so, if you assume that all of these weights are polynomially bounded uh, in ratio with respect to each other, uh, then Jerome and Sinclair basically showed that you can. Uh, uh, you can you can run a simple uh, Markov chain that can approximately sample from this. Uh, so this is a, a this is a result from the from uh, almost the 90s. Okay, but the really interesting case is when you have no restriction on these weights. All right. Okay. So uh, so in order to uh, tell you about how we get our results. Uh, I have to tell you about uh, certain results in uh, in the literature on uh, approximate sampling and counting. Uh, so can there I, are a lot. Can I ask yeah. a simple question, Nima? Um, so this is going to be a randomized algorithm. Yes. Okay, and and that equivalence, I assume that's only holds for randomized. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, I mean, sampling always needs randomness, but uh, but yeah, uh, if you uh, okay. So, uh, all right. So, um, the the result I'm going to mention is actually a follow up of a line of work, and I want to mention some cases of distributions that this line of work has has managed to basically handle. Um, so, uh, so in in approximate counting and sampling, there are a lot of results which say if the pairwise correlations in your distribution satisfy a certain property, then you can efficiently approximately sample, okay? Uh, so let me give you some examples of this. Uh, so, so, uh, so there are certain distributions which satisfy a property called negative correlation. The most famous one of them is uh, the, uniform dis uh, the uniform distribution over spanning trees of a graph. Uh, so, so uh, if you sample a spanning tree uh, from a from an undirected graph uniformly at random, then it's known to satisfy this inequality, which says that if you condition on any edge f to be part of the spanning tree, the probability of any other edge e actually comes down. Okay. Uh, so there are uh, uh, there are a lot of uh, other distributions which have. Uh, pairwise correlations that are zero except when, when things are basically near each other, okay? Uh, so, so a famous example of them is the hardcore model in, the, in, a, in a certain regime, uh, in, in the so-called uniqueness regime. So the hardcore model is a distribution defined on independent sets of a graph. So these are subsets of vertices that have no edge between them. And you weight each, uh, each uh, subset uh, with some parameter uh, lambda, so, so you let the probability of, of a subset S be lambda to the power S. There is a certain regime of lambda where uh, your distribution somehow suddenly uh, 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 satisfies this property called decay of correlation, which says if you have distant vertices U and V, uh, then conditioning on V being part of your S or not being part of your S uh, the probability of u doesn't change that much. The marginal of u doesn't change that much. 
and uh, uh, Kui Kui uh, has given a talk on this uh, in your seminars if you've if you've seen it before. Okay. All right. So uh, so something that Cynthia actually talked about recently was uh, was the case of matroids. So if you don't know what matroids are, uh, think of a bunch of vectors in some linear space. Uh, you want to select a basis from them uh, uniformly at random, a basis form from these vectors uniformly at random. Okay. So, so these things, uh, these distributions don't satisfy negative correlation or decay of correlation, but they satisfy uh, what you can call spectrally negative correlations. And I get to what exactly this means later on. So, so for, uh, for the monomer dimer sy uh, systems, we are going to show that uh, a generalization of this property of a spectral negative correlation actually holds. Okay. So, so uh, you know, monomer dimer systems are a little bit special because they, they don't fall into the two, uh, two more widely uh, studied categories of correlations. Uh, so if you think about it, uh, you know, you can easily define a monomer dimer system where you have positive correlations. So, so ignore dimers right now. So, you know, sample something from the monomer dimer system. Just look at the set of monomers. Okay. So even the set of monomers can have can show positive correlations. For example, a single edge. This is going to be part of a matching. Uh, if this is going to be part of a matching, then both endpoints are not a monomer. If uh, this edge is not part of the matching, then both endpoints are a monomer. So these are perfectly correlated with each other in a positive manner. Okay, so you have positive correlations. You, you can also easily construct examples where you don't have any decay of correlation. For example, consider a long path. Uh, and let's say there are no dimer weights, but there are monomer weights. Okay, so, so the, mon uh, the weight of each monomer here is uh, in the middle is zero, so it has to be matched. Otherwise, uh, you get a zero probability. Uh, and the two endpoints they can be matched, or they uh, they you know they can remain free, right? So now, if you know that this edge is going to be matched, this forces a certain uh, uh, subset of edges to be part of the matching. And if you uh, you know fix the parity correctly, that forces the other endpoint to be not part of the matching. So even though these two vertices are very distant, they still show a strong correlation with each other. So what we can show though, is that uh, for each vertex uh, that you fix, like this blue one, the number of, uh, you know, this is, this is uh, somewhat informal, so don't take it uh, very seriously. I'll formalize this more. Uh, for each vertex that you fix, like this blue one, the number of vertices that are you know, strongly correlated with it is not going to be that large. Okay. So here in this case, I constructed, uh, uh, you know, a strong correlation between this vertex and this vertex, but this was just like one other vertex, right? So this is, this is basically formalizing this and showing that, uh, you know, the number of such uh, strong correlation pairs cannot be too large. So this is, uh, this is the plan for, uh, for the rest of the talk. Uh, what I'm going to uh, show is that uh, monomer dimer systems have this property called bounded correlations, you know, a, a, a formalized version of what I just said. And then uh, uh, I'm going to show you that this uh, implies something called spectrally bounded correlations. This is a generalization of the properties uh, that we know for matroids. And uh, along the way, I'm going to connect these two properties of the partition function of your distribution. Uh, so these are called sector stability and fractional lock concavity, and I'll define what those are in the meantime. Um, so, so uh, you know, these are sector stability is a certain property about the roots of this partition function. Fractional lock concavity is a property about uh, you know how how the partition function. Uh, changes as you change the, uh, the weights in your monomer dimer system, okay? Uh, viewed as a function of those weights, uh, this is a certain analytic property of it, okay? And then I'm going to show that, uh, you know, fractional lock concavity, which is equivalent to a spectrally bounded correlations, uh, implies that you have uh, efficient approximate counting and sampling out.
So, so I'm going to focus on, on the right side first uh, before you know, defining sector stability and showing bounded correlations. I'm gonna talk about this part. Uh, you've, you've probably seen this part uh, repeated in previous talks that you, you might have attended. So here is a here is a recipe for for approximate sampling using this uh, this framework. Um, so you uh, so so this is a this is the high level framework we are going to follow. Uh, you know, given our distribution like the monomer dimer system, uh, we are going to view it as a weighted simplicial complex, or you can think of it as a weighted hypergraph. And then we are going to show that this, uh, this weighted simplicial complex or hypergraph satisfies uh, a certain notion of high dimensional expansion. And then uh, we are going to use uh, a lot of the results developed in the literature on high dimensional expanders to show that uh, certain random blocks can actually sample from our distribution for us. So, so uh, you know, just just a few pointers. Uh, uh, you might have seen this recipe in Cynthia's talk being applied to matroids. Uh, you might have seen it in Kui Kui's talk being applied to the hardcore model, and there has been follow-up work generalizing this for for arbitrary two spin systems. Uh, there are some recent works on on colorings, random colorings of graphs, where this recipe has been applied, and so on. Uh, but you know, but both of these two last cases, so so matroids are a, are a special case, but both of these uh, basically use uh, decay of correlations to show high dimensional expansion. Uh, whereas today we are going to show a new way of getting this high dimensional expansion. All right, so, so let me first uh, define how the first step of the framework works. Um, so uh, we are going to be working with pure simply shell complexes. So you can think of these as, hyper, as uniform hypergraphs. So basically we are gonna put weights on subsets of size K out of a ground set of N elements. And there is this K which is fixed. So that's the, that's the pure part. So, so there are some distributions uh, which automatically are of this form. For example, if you think of the random basis example I mentioned, uh, or matroids in general, uh, you know, any, any linear basis uh, formed by these vectors is going to have a size exactly the dimension of the space. So these, this is already a distribution on size k subsets out of a ground set of n elements. And if you've seen Cynthia's talk, there is a there is a natural random walk that you can define that uh, that samples from that you know converges to this distribution mu. There is a random walk between sets of size k and sets of size k minus one that you can define. Uh, sets of size k minus one here are just linearly independent subsets of vectors. Okay. So just a yeah. So if you've seen this talk, this is just going to be a reminder. Uh, the random walk works like this. You have your distribution on sets of size k. Uh, what you do is you start from some set of size k. You, uh, you uh, randomly sample one of the k elements and drop it from your set of size k. So that gets you to one of these three sets of size 2 here. And then uh, you, uh, so this is, this is uh, usually called the down uh, uh, step in, in, uh, in the literature on high dimensional expanders. Um, and there is a corresponding up step to go back the, to sets of size K. The up step is from anything that's a superset of this set of size K minus one, you choose one uh, with probability proportional to you know, the target distribution you are trying to sample from. Uh, nah. Sorry. Just one commentary. Uh, this idea of going from uh, you know, uh, the target size to one down and coming up goes back to the original work. So on sampling, in fact, in matchings of matching seed graphs to the works of Jerome and Sinclair in the 90s, which really built up this uh, machinery of uh, right. sampling using Markov chains. Wait, exactly. Maybe. Yeah, I mean, you can you can also even view this as like a generalization of the Glover dynamics, which physicists have been using for a long time. Um, um, yeah. 
But you, you don't, don't you want to make sure when you go back up that it's still linearly independent or? Yes, so this is gonna enforce that. So if a set is not linearly independent, it's mu is zero. Oh, uh, okay. So you never, you know, you never go to a set that's that has weight zero. Yes, yeah. I mean, uh, you know, the random walk itself is maybe you know uh, not a very uh, huge innovation, but the analysis of it using the tools from high dimensional expanders is very. Uh, but is this is this probably distribution easy to compute? Like, if it's hard to compute this probability distribution, then uh, you good. yeah, I'll get to that. So, uh, <laughs> uh, so turns out that for monomer dimer, yeah. So you're you're a few slides ahead of me. Uh, so for monomer dimer systems, if you view uh, uh, if you consider mu to be the distribution on just the monomer set then computing this mu is actually uh, the problem of computing a certain perfect number of perfect matchings on an induced subgraph, um, which you can do in the case of planar graphs. But I'll get to it, yeah. Yeah, so, so you have to be able to, so, so the, the general assumption here is that you have an oracle that computes this for you. So for example, in the, in the linear basis case, you can check whether a set is linearly independent or not. Um, yeah. Okay. So, uh, so this uh, this random walk, the combination of these two steps, the the down step and the up step, uh, converge to the mu distribution no matter what. So that that's that's going to be a stationary distribution of this random walk. So the only question is how fast is this convergence? So, so before I go on to the question of how fast this convergence is, let's see how it's applied to, to the monomer uh, dimer distribution, right? So, so unfortunately, not all distributions are going to be you know, on subsets of size k out of a ground set of n elements, uh, but that's not a huge problem. We can, we can transform them into an equivalent form that's, that's of, of the standard type. Uh, for example, in the monomer dimer distribution, uh, you could have, uh, if, if you think about just, subs, uh, just subsets of vertices, which are the monomers, uh, this subset doesn't have a fixed size, uh, but you can, you can actually form a, an equivalent form by looking at, uh, for each vertex, you have basically two choices, whether it's, not, it's going to be part of the monomer set or whether it's going to be out of the monomer set. So, so, uh, so I form a ground set with twice the number of nodes, many elements corresponding to these choices. Uh, so for each vertex, uh, we introduce you know, a gray choice and, a, and an orange choice. Uh, and then we are only looking at subsets of these choices where uh, you've, you've selected uh, one choice for each vertex, right? So is this, is this clear enough? So, uh, so okay. So, so any any subset of uh, the n nodes can be represented as a subset of size, uh, you know, this of the the twice many uh, choices that you have. Okay. Right. So, so if you uh, if you do this transformation to your distribution, uh, now you can run the same random walk that I just described. Uh, your random walk would uh, move between sets of size k and sets of size k minus one. Here, a set of size k minus one, at least the interesting ones, are the ones where you fix the choice of being part of the uh, part of the monomer set or not for all but one vertex. And you know, this white one is is the one vertex where you haven't chosen, where you haven't fixed your choice. Okay. So uh, so if you think about it, uh, the here is how the random walk would work. You, uh, you start from some configuration uh, on the left. You've, you've chosen uh, orange or gray for every vertex. Now you select one of the choices and drop it, meaning that you, you mark the, one of the vertices chosen uniformly at that uh, with white. And now you, uh, you replace the color of this white vertex with the two possible choices. Uh, you know, probabilistically with probabilities dictated by, by your mu, by the mu of the resulting computation. And this is exactly the global dynamics that physicists have been studying for a long time. Okay. 
So, uh, so, so the good thing for for us is that uh, you know you have to have you have to be able to compute the mu of of a resulting configuration, and basically the only thing that we are going to use for from planarity is that we can compute the mu of a resulting configuration. So if you think about a subset of uh, monomers that you fix, like, like this one, uh, the weight of that monomer set is the number of you know, perfect matchings in the complement graph, in the gray part. Okay. And for planar graphs, we can compute the number of perfect matchings in this gray part. That's going to be the mu of our resulting confirmation. Okay, so you can, you can simulate this random walk for, for planar graphs. There is a there is a serious issue here, and uh, you know if you if you have a frowning face, I, I understand why. Uh, so there uh, so there is a, the serious issue here is that if you if you do this random walk, you are just you know stepping in the same place. Okay, so you you unmark a vertex, but you have to always mark it back the same color as it was before. Uh, that's because you know. Uh, the, the parity of the number of monomers is always the same. It's, it's going to be odd or even based on the number of vertices in the graph. Uh, so no matter what vertex you, you uncolor, you have to color it back the same. Okay. So that's, that's an easy issue to, to get around. Uh, so if you, uh, if you go down and up, uh, uh, if, when you are going down, if you, if you uncolor more than one vertex, then you can move between various configurations. Uh, so in the case of uh, monomer dimer distribution, as soon as you move between subsets of size k and subsets of size k minus two, uh, you have you have uh, the ability to move between any two configurations. Okay. Sorry. So uh, you know uh, uh, you don't have to you don't have to confine yourself to k minus two. You can go down to k minus three, k minus four. All of these are good. In fact, you can push this to the very extreme and go down to uh, sets of size zero. <laughs> okay. uh, so this is a trivial random walk that mixes in just one step. Uh, basically, you go from uh, whatever configuration you have or whatever subset of size k you have to the empty set. And then in the up step, you have to do a lot of work. You have to sample a set of size k with probability proportional to its mu, which is the original problem you were trying to solve. So, so this shows that this, uh, these types of random walks are only efficiently implementable if the, the op step is effic efficiently implementable, uh, which means that the number of, uh, uh, you know, you want the number of elements that you're adding in the op step to be bounded by a constant. So you can efficiently enumerate over them. Okay. But nevertheless, uh, you know, theoretically, it's, it's actually interesting to, to consider these extreme random walks. Uh, a slightly less extreme version of this is the random walk that moves between sets of size k and sets of size 1. Okay. So this random walk is still not efficiently implementable, but has non-trivial information theoretically. Okay. So, so this random walk just, you know, you, uh, it's just moving between sets of size k and the n elements. So on the bottom, you have the n elements. Now, now, all of these walks that, I've, that we've been studying so far are bipartite walks. And uh, you know, the mixing property of the down up uh, step uh, is actually the same as the mixing properties of an up step followed by a down step. So you, uh, you know, this is, for this part, you can just you know, believe me, or if you want, you can ask me questions. Uh, but uh, to study various properties of this random walk on sets of size k, you can also, you might as well study the, the same random walk, but just going between the elements. So you start from an element, you go to a set of size k that contains it, and then you go down. Okay. So, so if you consider this simplified random walk that moves between the n elements, it has, uh, it has a, a probability transition matrix. It's an n by n matrix. And the, the entries of it I've written for you here. So, so if, you, if you start from some element i, uh, you move to an element j with probability 1 over k times the conditional probability of j given i. Okay. And, and you, you see how correlations are actually showing up in our, uh, 
uh, in here, right? Okay. So, so the question is, uh, you know, I'm, I'm still going to ask this question, even though the, the extreme random walk doesn't mixes, the, uh, doesn't, isn't efficiently implementable. I'm, I'm still going to ask, what is its mixing time? How, how fast does it converge to, to the distribution it has to? So, uh, so to study that, you can just uh, subtract the stationary distribution from every row of this uh, transition probability matrix, and then just uh, study the spectral properties of this matrix. Okay. So as long as uh, uh, as long as this matrix has uh, you know spectrum bounded by some constant, this random walk mixes in uh, in constant number of steps, or at actually the relaxation time of it is is is, is constant. But the, re but the really interesting thing is that for a lot of distributions, uh, uh, not, only is this, uh, not only is this extreme random walk you know, mixing in constant number of steps, but it actually mixes in uh, sub-constant number of steps. Um, so, so more formally, there are a lot of distributions, including our monomer dimer distribution, where you can show that this, uh, this matrix uh, has with even even when you put the factor of one over k, uh, you know, away, uh, you can show that this matrix has uh, has a maximum eigenvalue bounded by order one. Okay, so this implies that uh, uh, you know the random walk has a second eigenvalue bounded by factor of one over k. The one over k comes from here. And uh, you know the second eigenvalue comes from the fact that we have already basically killed the first eigenvalue by subtracting the stationary distribution. OK. So, so, so this, actually, so if you, if you have any distribution for which you can show this, that the correlation matrix has maximum eigenvalue bounded by order 1, this actually guarantees that there is a there is a, a polynomial mixing time, or actually polynomial relaxation time. But don't worry if you don't know what's the difference uh, for a random walk that moves between sets of size k and sets of size k minus order one. Okay. And all of these orders are related to each other. So whatever you constant prove here, whatever constant you get here, uh, actually shows up here. <laughs> And also shows up as the power of k in this poly k bound. Uh, just one comment, uh, Nima. Uh, just just to stress that the new matrix you are considering is the size of the element sets yes. in your in your hypergraph, whereas the size on which you are uh, going to do the sampling is potentially of exponential size. Right. Uh, but you are still shooting for a uh, mixing time, which is polynomial in the number of elements, which may be logarithmic in the. Um, yes. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Thanks, Avi. Yeah. Polynomial in K is logarithmic in the exponential size graph, which has potentially n to the K many uh, elements. Yes. Okay. So, uh, yeah, I'm actually a little bit behind in time. So, okay. So, um, you know, uh, so this the reason that this this holds true. The reason that uh, basically ultra rapid mixing of the k to one random walk uh, implies rapid mixing of the k to k minus order one random walk comes from basically uh, this phenomenon uh, found in the study of high dimensional expanders called local to global expansion. Okay, and uh, uh, I wanted to basically. Uh, Show you, uh, you know, a sketch of why this holds. Uh, but maybe, maybe I'll, uh, I'll try to go fast over it or skip it in the interest of time. Uh, so, uh, you know, let me let me just give you the, the the general framework, right? So let's say that you start from uh, some distribution new. So so initially, when you start your random walk, this is just going to be uh, the deterministic distribution, the 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 Dirac delta on a uh, on a particular subset of size k, okay? So if you can show that when you go down, basically when you remove elements from your new, 
your, your, uh, the resulting distribution, which is now on subsets of smaller size, on subsets of size k minus order one, is basically closer to, to, to the target distribution when you do the same operation to it. Uh, if you can show this, then, uh, then you're done because basically the up step can never increase distances. So as long as the down step uh, you know, gets distributions closer to each other, uh, every, every uh, combination of these two steps gets the distributions closer to each other. So, so the important thing is how close do you get when you when you take this uh, this down step? Okay. And uh, yeah, let me let me go over this very quickly. So the point is uh, 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 the point is uh, if you if you consider the uh, the density of your distribution nu with respect to the target distribution mu. You can, you can define various measures of distance here. Uh, generally, you can define an F divergence between these and so on. But, but you know, for simplicity, take the, take the variance of these numbers that you see. If you had already converged, all of these numbers would be one. Um, so the variance would be zero. Uh, uh, but in general, if, if you haven't converged, there is gonna be some, some, uh, uh, some variance in these numbers. Now, uh, now the, the ultra rapid convergence of, of the K21 random walk basically says that if you consider the distribution at level one on, on single elements, the variance of this is actually not, not going to be huge compared to the variance down here. Okay. So, so the variance up here is going to be roughly a constant divided by K fraction of the variance down here. Now, uh, now, if you look at uh, uh, your distribution conditioned on a particular element being inside of it, so let's say you, you condition on this element being inside of it, you now uh, can apply the same reasoning to, to basically this subtree and say that the variance at this level is going to be uh, a fraction over, so, so the variance at level one, is at most a constant divided by k times the variance at level k. But by, by the same reasoning applied to conditionings of your distribution, you can say that the variance at level two minus the variance at level one is order one divided by k minus one times the variance at level k minus the variance at level one. Okay. So, so, so basically the, the variance at level, uh, at level one uh, can only consume at most a one over K fraction of the total variance. The variance at level two can consume a one over K minus one fraction of the remaining variance. Uh, the variance at level three can consume a one over K minus two fraction and so on, right? So if you go down, uh, until you get to basically constant levels above K, you still have a fraction of the variance left. Uh, so, so that's basically the reason why uh, when you go down by, from, from K to K minus order of one, the variance of these numbers gets reduced by some constant factor. Okay, that's a very high level sketch. I, I don't expect you to fully follow it, but uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, let me move on. So, um, all right. So, uh, so this so this shows that uh, to analyze these random walks, you just have to analyze the K to one random walk, uh, or basically study the correlation matrix that I mentioned. So, uh, so it turns out that you can also study this correlation matrix uh, using more uh, using tools that are of more algebraic nature. Uh, so, so basically, the, whatever I said translates into the language of polynomials in this way. Uh, so, so you can consider uh, for a distribution on subsets of size k, a polynomial of degree a question. k. Yes. Uh, a question. Uh, so when you said this, uh, uh, applying the previous slide, uh, you need the property to hold not just for the original hypergraph, but for, I guess, every link of the hypergraph. I mean, exactly. on every subset of vertices. 
yes. where I guess this is where you use the fact that the family is downward closed. Uh, you mean the family of graphs? The family of, uh, uh, well, you need, you no, need the actually... condition of um, uh, ultra um, convergence to hold uh, on every- For all limit. conditionings of your distribution, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Yes, yes, yeah, perfect. Yeah, I, I didn't maybe explicitly mention it, but it was on the slides, yes. Uh, so, uh, so, so actually, so, this algebraic language actually lets you uh, not worry too much about those conditionings. And that's one of the reasons I like this algebraic interpretation better. Um, so, so let me get to, to what this algebraic interpretation is. Um, so if you have a distribution on subsets of size k out of n elements, you can define a generating polynomial for it. This is, this is a partition function when, where you have basically applied uh, a weight to every element, a weight coming from this variable zi. Um, so, so for each subset of size k, you, uh, you take the product of the variables from that subset times mu of that subset, and then sum this over all subsets. That's, a, that's the generating polynomial. And uh, if you just do some algebra, you can see that uh, the correlation matrix is actually related to the Hessian of some, uh, some transformation of this polynomial. Uh, the correlation matrix becomes similar to the Hessian of some, some transformation of this polynomial, and that transformation of this polynomial is exactly this. You replace each variable with a fractional power of it. Uh, so, so think of alpha as some constant between zero and one. Uh, so, so after you do this, you no longer have a polynomial, but you still have a function defined, well-defined over the positive orthand, let's say. And as long as this function is log concave around the point zi is equal one, uh, that's exactly the same as saying that that correlation matrix has maximum eigenvalue bounded by a constant. Okay. So I'm not gonna prove this uh, for you, it's just algebraic manipulation. But uh, uh, the, the good thing about this formulation is that if you, if you actually ignore this condition, if you can show that this, this polynomial has this property at all points in the positive orthand, uh, that, that, that the log of this thing is concave over all of the points in the positive orthand, then basically you get the, you get the conditionings for free. Um, so so here, is a, here is a simple reason why. Basically, if you want to condition on your distribution, conditioned on element one being part of it, part of your set, uh, what you can do is you can basically uh, take, uh, take your polynomial, multiply the first variable by some positive constant lambda, and then divide by lambda and let lambda go to infinity. Okay. So, so both of these operations preserve fractional log concavity. Uh, and you know, it's a property that's closed under limits. So the limit of it is also going to be fractionally log concave. And this is this is the this is the polynomial for your distribution conditioned on element one being part of it. Okay. So as long as you have fractional log concavity at all points in the positive orthand, you automatically get uh, get fast mixing. Okay. So uh, so all right. So I'm done with this part of the the chain. Uh, now let me get into the more interesting and more more new stuff. <laughs> um, uh, which is which is sector stability of polynomials and bounded correlations. Okay, so so the way we are going to bound the the norm of the uh, the correlation matrix is by uh, this uh, this relationship between uh, various matrix norms. In particular, uh, the spectral norm of a matrix is always upper bounded by uh, the maximum L one norm of uh, of rows or alternatively columns of the same matrix. And this is what we are going to show for, for the matching case. We are going to show that once you fix the vertex V, if you sum over all vertices, uh, uh, oops, sorry, this should be, uh, yeah. If once you fix the vertex U, uh, once you sum over all other vertices V, the amount of correlation between U and V, this is going to be bounded. Bounded by order one. So automatically, this gives you that the maximum eigenvalue of that correlation matrix is bounded by the same norm. Okay. 
so just a quick note that this uh, this approach of bounding the L1 norms was already used in, in prior work in the hardcore model to spin systems and colorings, but all of them relied crucially on correlation decay to get this. And now I want to show you that uh, properties of the polynomial, uh, properties of roots of the polynomial can also imply this. So what is, what is the property that implies uh, this boundedness of the L1 norm of rows? Uh, it's, it's what I call sector stability. This is actually a property that was uh, you know, studied in, in simpler cases uh, by Sendov uh, uh, many, many years ago. Uh, so the name actually is already out there in the literature. So, so uh, we call a polynomial sector stable uh, if there is a sector in the complex plane around the positive orth band, such that whenever you plug in numbers from this uh, sector of the complex plane, your polynomial doesn't get zero. Okay. Uh, if you're familiar with the, with the physics intuition of it, this is basically saying that you have no zeros near the positive real axis, or in other words, your system doesn't have any phase transitions. Okay. So fortunately, uh, there is a polynomial for, uh, for monomer dimer systems, and Hallman and Lieb had shown that this polynomial satisfies some form of sector stability. In particular, if you consider the non-size constraint and the non-homogenized version of the monomer dimer distribution, uh, Hallman and Lieb showed that basically this polynomial, where you sum over all subsets of monomers, uh, the weight of that monomer set times the product of the variables in that monomer set, this polynomial is actually stable with respect to the entire right half plane. So a sector of aperture pi, basically. Right? So, so this actually is not useful by itself uh, yet. You actually have to homogenize this distribution because we've been working with really homogeneous distributions on subsets of size exactly k. But fortunately, this notion of sector stability uh, is very robust to, to, these, uh, to these kinds of operations. For example, if you start with, uh, with this polynomial and you homogenize it, uh, then you get actually a sector stable polynomial with slightly worse sector stability. Okay. So, so if you start with the, with the polynomial that Heinen and Lieb uh, studied, uh, this is the polynomial that you get by homogenizing it. You introduce these new variables z prime one up to z prime n. Uh, you divide uh, each zi by z prime i, and then you multiply z prime i so that you get a polynomial in the end. Okay. So zi is the variable you use whenever uh, that vertex is part of the monomer. Uh, z prime i is when you uh, when that vertex is not part of the monomer. Now, if, if the i's and z prime i's are chosen from a sector of aperture pi over two, their, uh, you know, their ratio is going to be in the right half plane. Therefore, this is never zero, right? So, so this shows that the homogenized version is sector stable with a slightly you know, smaller sector with respect to a slightly smaller sector. And what we, what we basically showed was that if you have sector stability with respect to any sector that, that has aperture a constant, then uh, you get that the, the L1 norms of rows are bounded by a constant. Okay. So I wanna, I wanna just give you a quick proof sketch of this fact. Uh, so if you wanna bound the L1 norm of the i throw of the correlation matrix, here is the quantity that you have to bound. Um, so, so the L1 norm is you look at each entry, whether it's positive or negative, uh, you, you, you multiply that by the, by the corresponding sign and then sum this over all of the entries of that row, right? So, so let those choices of signs be this vector W, right? So W is just a sign vector. Uh, what you have to basically show is that the expected dot product of this sign vector with the indicator of your set when you condition on i uh, and when you don't condition on i are not too far apart from each other. Okay. So basically, yeah, so this quantity, the expected dot product of this sine vector with the indicator vector of your random set, you have to show that it doesn't change by much when you, when you condition on i. 
Now, now look at the polynomial that basically encodes the distribution of uh, this quantity, okay? Look at the polynomial that encodes this quantity in the powers of a variable z. So this is a univariate polynomial. There is a single variable uh, z. Uh, I look at the expected value of z raised to the power of this. This is going to be uh, you know, a polynomial with potentially negative powers, but that doesn't really matter. So you can get this from the generating polynomial of your distribution by replacing the, the original variables in the distribution by z and z inverses. Basically, you know, whenever this sign vector tells you negative one, you put in z inverse. Whenever this sign uh, vector tells you plus one, you put in z, right? Sectors are actually, uh, you know, uh, preserved under this operation of inversion, right? Uh, the inverse of all of the complex numbers inside the sector uh, is inside the same sector, right? So this is still going to be sector stable with respect to the same sector. Right? Now, in fact, uh, uh, you know, uh, by by changing the weight of the element i, or by multiplying the variable z i by a positive constant, you can actually show that the uh, you can you can basically change the the weighting of of, of this polynomial. So you can get a, a bunch of other polynomials. Uh, where you, you change the weight of the element i to be any positive constant and the, uh, you know, the negation of it any other positive constant. So if you, if you consider these two polynomials, when you, when you condition on i being in s and i not being in s, any positive combination of them is also going to be sector stable with respect to the same sector. This is just by changing the weight of the variable i. Okay. Question. Yes. Where do you use the property of W that it was chosen to be minus if the sign was negative and plus if the sign was positive? Here in the powers of Z. No, you use it in the definition, but uh, would this trick work regardless of W? Sorry? Would... I'm going to basically show this for all W. Yeah, exactly. That was my point. It will work for all W. Yes, this will, this will work for all W. Therefore, this will imply that the L1 norm is bound. Yeah, so, so, yeah. so I'm showing this for a fixed W, but you know, works for all W, basically. So in particular, I mean, just, um, it's basically a strong way of saying that really all the entries in this correlation matrix are really small. Yes. All of them the are. Some yeah. of them, yeah. All of them are, yeah. Really, at the, all about of them. Uh, no, one over k. Necessarily. No, there can be some some huge ones, but then the, there can't be too many of them. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So so now we have two polynomials, each one each one of which is sector stable, and any positive combination of them is also sector stable. Right. So if you plug in z from that sector. You get two complex numbers, any positive combination of which is not going to be zero. Right? So this says that the, the ratio of these two numbers can never be a negative number, can never be a negative real line, uh, a, a number in the negative real line. Right? So, so if you divide the ratios, you never get a negative real. Right? So now you do some complex uh, analysis tricks. <laughs> There is a branch of log defined for the complex plane minus the negative reals. So you can define this function. Uh, it's going to be complex analytic uh, on the domain of the sector, right? And if you do a simple transformation over it, you're going to have a function that maps uh, something like this. So, so H is going to be a function that maps uh, uh, you know, a band around the real line of, uh, of, of height, uh, roughly the aperture to another band around the real line uh, of, of height, basically two pi. Now, all of, the, all of the probabilistic quantities that we want are actually encoded in this function h. It's actually the derivative of h. Uh, you, can, you can just calculate the derivatives and see that the derivative of h at, at the point one is exactly this quantity. Uh, okay. So now you have a complex analytic function that maps a band around the real line to a, 
to a larger, slightly larger band around the real line. And it also has a fixed point. The, it sends the point zero to the point zero. Um, and uh, you know, this, is a, this, is a, this is one of those exercises that, uh, that people see in, in complex analysis that if you, if you have a function that sends, let's say the disk to the disk and fixes the point zero, then its derivative is always going to be bounded by one at zero, right? So, so by doing transformations so that these bands become these circles, you can show that the, the, the derivative of such a function, which fixes the real line to the real line, has to be bounded by the height of this divided by the height of this, which is roughly one over the aperture. So, uh, so yeah, so, uh, so that's basically the sketch of the proof. I wanna say that uh, this property of sector stability is actually more robust. Not, it, it's, it doesn't just you know, degrade uh, robustly under homogenization. Uh, you can actually do a lot of other things to it and, and still get sector stable polynomials. For example, if you consider the monomer distribution and you, condi uh, you condition on having exactly K matching, K monomers, uh, then you still get a sector stable polynomial with aperture pi over two. Uh, this is this is just a yeah uh, yeah I won't I won't be able to show you the proof of this but uh, this is true. Um, there are other distributions that you can you can show are sector stable. For example, if you start with a polynomial that has the entire right half plane as its sector, uh, if you basically uh, uh, consider the colored version of that distribution, uh, you're gonna have a sector stable polynomial with, uh, uh, with, uh, with aperture uh, shrunk by a function of the number of colors you're using. So what do, what do I mean by coloring of a distribution? Uh, you color the N elements in the ground set using a number of colors and you restrict your distribution to, to those sets which have exactly CI many colors from color I, CI elements from color I. So this in particular uh, captures some basic forms of matroid intersection, which is still uh, you know, a, a question at large for, for approximate counting. All right, uh, yeah, so there are other distributions which I didn't get to mention. So, so let me conclude. Uh, so, so basically what we did was show how using uh, basically root locations of polynomials, we can show mixing and also show some sort of lock concavity. Um, so the question is, uh, uh, so there are, there are a bunch of questions here. One of them is, uh, uh, you know, can this L1, so, so in a lot of these applications uh, of this framework, uh, you are going to bound the L1 normal rows and, or columns of the correlation matrix. The only case where we, where we directly bound the spectral norm of the correlation matrix is the case of matroids. Uh, so it's still a, a, an interesting question whether, whether the L1 norm of rows or columns also suffices in that case. And uh, uh, another question is, uh, now that we have this notion of fractionally lock concave uh, and sector stable polynomials, what are other distributions that can be shown to satisfy these? Uh, one of, uh, one of there's, a, there's a crisp conjecture that I've actually checked with computer simulation. Um, if you have uh, uh, the uniform distribution over, uh, over a zero one uh, polytope uh, with, whose edge lengths are bounded by order one, uh, then the conjecture is that this is going to be fractionally lock concave. Um, this is a distribution on the vertices of the polytope or the interior of the yes. polytope? So mu is, a, is the uniform distribution on a subset of zero one to the n. Uh, so uniform distribution, yeah. And the assumption is that the convex hull of S has edge lengths bounded by order one. And the conclusion of the conjecture would be that the uh, polynomial of mu is fractionally log concave. This is, uh, this is interesting because uh, 
you know, matroids have this property. Matroids have edge lengths that are bounded by, by some constant and they satisfy log concavity, not just fractional log concavity. But there are a lot of combinatorial uh, things that people are interested in. For example, delta matroids or more generally Coxeter matroids, uh, uh, you know, matroid intersections where one of the matroids is like a partition matroid with, with uh, constant many partitions. All of them satisfy this, this condition that their edge length is bounded by a constant. Uh, uh, so if you can show this conjecture, you automatically get sampling uh, for, for a lot of these distributions. And yeah, that's it. Thanks. Great. Thanks. First of all, I'll clap for everybody. <laughs> and let me uh, yeah, ask people to ask questions. So Nima, the, the sector stability um, Im implies fractional log concavity, at least in some instances or in all instances. In all instances. What's the relationship between the aperture of the sector and the fraction that you get? Uh, so good, the, the relation we get is not optimal. <laughs> uh, we lose a constant factor of two. So. Um, so if, uh, if we have basically pi over, uh, pi over k uh, aperture, this implies uh, 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 1 over 2k fractionally stable, fractionally lock on k. For this factor 2 is probably not necessary, but our current proof uh, needs it. And then in particular for... Uh, so, so the conjecture would be that for monomer dimer distributions, if you replace the variables by their square root, you should get a log concave thing. But currently we have to replace them by a fourth root. And this, this is analogous to like all, so stable with respect to like a half plane will give you. Yeah, so, so there is this result case. of guarding, which, which basically shows that, uh, guarding was the one who, 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 who showed that hyperbolic or basically real stable mm -hmm. uh, implies lock on cave. So this is basically some generalization of this result, except you know, with this loss of factor two. <laughs> Thanks. More questions. So uh, like a general long-term goal for which this tool may not suffice is for example, a sampling from Matroid intersection in general. Mm -hmm. Two matroid intersection. Yeah. yeah. So, so for sampling from matroid intersections in general, um, you know, one particular case of that is bipartite perfect matchings, and you know, uh, uh, local local random box like this don't even mix in that case, right? Uh, uh, even in the case of you know bipartite perfect matchings, if you have like a cycle of length n, uh, there are exactly just two perfect matchings here, but you can you cannot move from one to the other without changing all of the elements. Um, so yeah, so it's a good question of whether or not you can basically re-implement the program of uh, Jerome Sinclair and Jerome Sinclair Vigoda here. Uh, so one hope would be to show that. Uh, if you can, uh, if you basically uh, go to not just the major, uh, basis elements of a full rank, but also include uh, basis elements of you know one lower rank, then maybe you get the analog of Jerome Sinclair and you get fast mixing chains there. Uh, 
So, so, the, so these are actually very, uh, yeah, matrix intersections are, are actually very interesting questions. They, they're also very related to these quantities that people actually want to compute, like mixed volume or mixed discriminant. Uh, so these are all uh, basically colored versions of some lock concave or real stable polynomial. And uh, yeah, so if, uh, if you look at this, this coloring thing. Uh, if you allow the number of colors to be arbitrary, then you get all of these problems. Uh, matroid intersection, mixed discriminant, mixed volume, so on. Um, so we can solve it when, when the number of colors is, is bounded in the real stable case, but yeah. All questions? Okay, let's thank Nima again. Great, thanks.